everyone, this is Ivan Oleg Smith with Yoga You Online, and I'm very pleased to be here today with Tom Myers for our Yoga You Online interview for today. Tom is widely known in bodywork and anatomy circles for his pioneering book, Anatomy Trains, which offers a visionary reconceptualization of the anatomy of the body from small bits and parts to a wholeness consisting of interconnected myofascial lines. Tom originally trained as a body worker with Dr. Ida Rolf and also with Moshe Feldenkrais, both of whom are two of the leading somatic visionaries of our time. Tom is also known for his deep insights into the role of fascia as it relates to the structural health of the body and even the emotional health and well-being that we experience. And Tom joins us today to talk about new insights into fascia research and how it impacts our traditional understanding of the anatomy of the body. Tom, welcome. Hi, Eva. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks yeah, for that fulsome pleasure. introduction. <laughs> now, first of all, you are an expert in anatomy. You have taught anatomy as part of the Rolfing training for many, many decades. And anatomy, of course, is a huge field. Uh, but you have chosen to specialize in fascia. So tell us about, first of all, what fascia is and what originally spurred your interest in this area? Well, I just, I do want to take down being an expert in anatomy. I'm not, I'm an absolutely amateur anatomist. I just have a great interest. Um, and my interest is really comes out of my practice and I've been doing um, bodywork practice for 40 years. This is my 40th year. I graduated in 1976 from Iberoff School. And I did teach there for, um, well, I practiced for a while and then I taught there for a while and uh, left in 98, 99 to, to form my own school. And uh, the interest in fascia really came from her, absolutely. She was uh, a voice in the wilderness about fascia in the 1970s and there was really nothing, nothing at all written about this, very few articles that we could get from osteopathic journals. So the fascial research that's come out in the last um, eight years has been really amazing, both in terms of what it has confirmed about what we thought we knew about the fascia and what it has not confirmed about what we thought we knew about the fascia. The whole idea of fascia, I have to say, is a bigger idea than just the fabric. Um, that word fascia has been, it's a perfectly good medical term that just refers to certain sheets inside the body, but we're expanding that use out to, to make it about the whole, what I now like to call the biomechanical regulatory system or biomechanical autoregulatory system because we do a lot of self-regulation with our, huh. our, our own cells. Um, and when I'm looking at a, at a chronic injury, I'm, there is the question of what failed, but which is usually a fascial structure if you're talking about a chronic injury because muscles um, are so well supplied with blood, they clear themselves up very easily. Nerves is, of course, a different kind of question, and they don't clear themselves up easily. Um, but fascia, because it has much less blood supply, injuries to your tendons, injuries to where the tendons attach to the bones, which are very common in yoga, um, injuries of the ligaments, these are injuries of the fascial net, this connective tissue web. So we're really talking about this whole thing that exists between the cells. Um, you've hmm. got about 70 trillion cells in your body, and uh, what we're calling fascia is almost everything that isn't a cell that is part of you. Um, and it really has been considered kind of this dead packing material and thrown over the shoulders of most anatomists. And so it's really, as a system, only getting the attention that it deserves in these last uh, 30 or so years. And uh, very much in response to what Ida Rolf was doing, but 
also a lot of other people have started to get interested. Surgeons started to get interested in fascia and recovery. Rehabilitation people started to realize how much these things were fascial injuries. So a lot of, of people have come forward, but I was very glad to get a hold of her back in the 70s when right, uh, right. there was nobody much talking about this. Yeah. So tell us more about this concept of fascia as a system, exactly what is meant by that and what has caused researchers to start thinking of it like that, because that's a pretty big step from inert wrapping material to a body ride regulatory system. It certainly is a change and it's a change that is still, oh, we have a cat here. Um, <laughs> oh, he's a cutie. The scenery. Hello. <laughs> the, uh, it was, it's always been very clear since 1548, since we started having this uh, anatomy thing. And I'm actually going to go see the uh, laboratory in Padua, Italy, where the first anatomy dissections that, uh, wow. that got published were wow. uh, in 1548. And that, that guy, Andreas Vesalius, who did that, you've seen his skeleton and his other, right, they, right. they're very famous uh, and widely used drawings. But the, um, ever since then, we've had a complete picture of the nervous system. Um, of course it's been filled in, of course we're having the project on the brain now, there's so much about the brain that we don't know. There's plenty about the spinal cord that we don't know. We do know a lot about nerves. We do know that when we're looking at a problem with the median nerve in your carpal tunnel or, uh, a nerve going through the brachial plexus in your shoulder, that it's part of a system. Hmm. And we treat it as part of the nervous system. Right. And we know when you're having trouble with your coronary arteries, it's not just a local thing, it's part of the whole, uh, of a whole process that's happening to the cardiovascular system. Hmm. But when you say, I've got plantar fasciitis, the person you go to see is very likely to just look at your plantar mm -hmm. fascia as if that was a separate structure, as if that could be considered as a separate structure. It's not. It's also part of a self-regulatory system. Mm. The fascial system self-regulates in the same way that the nervous system does and the cardiovascular system does. I say that it's the same way, but it doesn't do it in the same way, actually. It's, uh, it's a different kind of thing because what you think of as a tendon is mostly not cells. It's mostly stuff that's been made by cells and stuck into the intercellular environment and because the muscle kept tugging on it, it turned into a tendon. But the fascial system that makes up the tendon, that makes up the fascia that's in the muscle, that makes up the cling wrap coating that's going around the bone that the muscle is attaching to, um, all of that was manufactured by cells and stuck out into the intercellular space and then organizes itself into what we're familiar with, the skeleton and the um, tendons and the ligaments. Now the bone is very well attended by osteocytes, cells in the bone that maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, the fascia is maintained by fibroblasts, fiber makers or fibrocytes sometimes called, but they are mostly all classes of fibroblasts. And it's amazing how much they do, they make all different things from the cornea of your eye to the valves of your heart, to your tendons, to your, the fascia that goes around your muscles, to the fascia lata on the outside of your thigh, to the dentin in your teeth. It's, uh, you can wow. make a whole bunch of things out of these simple materials. It's amazing how much, what, how many different kinds of things the body does make out of these basic elements of fascia. Right. Um, and then, in order, once you have an injury in one of these things, this is why I was saying this, once you have an injury in one of these things, it's kind of by remote control that it has to be repaired. Um, it reply, it re, uh, relies on the water seeping into that area. It relies, on, because there's not a great blood supply to most fascial structures, it relies on cells that might be a little bit distant to manufacture the materials that then have to get to the place. The worst of these, the worst of these is cartilage. Cartilage has no blood supply and really supplies, uh, uh, really relies on seepage to, to get new stuff there to rebuild the cartilage. So people with cartilage injuries are the ones that are complaining months and months and months down the road because it takes the cartilage so long to repair because yeah. it's reliant on distant cells and not a good blood supply. 
So we're watching how this, uh, we're, we're learning a lot, research by research, on how this system self-regulates and puts itself back in. Mm -hmm. So the, the practical question that I would put out for the yoga teacher now, um, and I think yoga teachers are better equipped than physiotherapists to answer this question in some ways because of the way that they work, which is if you see a chronic injury, the question that you ask is not what happened that this injury happened, but why isn't it clearing itself up? Mm. All of these injuries will clear them. So you think of the number of things that you have. You always have something going on. Oh, my shoulder hurts this morning, or I slept wrong and my neck is funny, but by by noon it's cleared itself out, or by a couple of days it's, you pull a muscle in your back and by a couple of days it's cleared up. Um, the question when something gets chronic is why didn't it clear up? Why didn't right. the local processes of putting the system back together work? Um, right. And that's usually tagged somewhere else in the system, and that's why I think it's so important to see the fascia as a system, as a body-wide right. system that is responding body-wide, is because the key that's going to help you with this thing uh, is perhaps very distant, perhaps at the other end of the body from the injury that you're looking at. I wanted to get back um, to this whole concept of, you know, the self-regulating functions of the body and the formation of the fascia, because, you know, one of the things that you sort of slipped by us was, um, <laughs> you know, how cartilage takes a long time to heal. But of course, traditionally, we have thought as cartilage as something that really could not regenerate itself um, precisely because it doesn't have much blood supply so is this a new way of thinking that indeed cartilage can heal itself and what are the mechanics uh, for that? probably gonna get myself in trouble here um but i have seen people do rehabilitate cartilage. Um, it is, like many things, um, easier in the young. Um, but I've seen people who had meniscal operations where the meniscus was taken out and it reforms in white fibrocartilage over a period of a couple of years. Um, the, usually the thing with cartilage is if you can leave it alone for long enough, it will repair. The trouble is, is that you can't leave your knee alone you're going to put weight on it, you're going to slide on it with almost every movement that you do. This is the difficulty with shoulder injuries with people um, to, to have them repair. Is it's very difficult to even walk without moving your shoulder, even if you put your shoulder in a sling. And all these fascial bonds remake, this is, includes a broken bone, broken cartilage, broken tendon, anything, they all remake one molecule at a time one hydrogen bond at a time. It is the simplest, stupidest chemical bond in the universe. But if you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them, you have the strength of a tendon. Did you know that your Achilles tendon is around 60% water? It's only about 40% oh. fiber. Uh, wow. So wow. much of, I mean, then that's really, really dense tissue. Yeah. And that's 60%. If you squeezed all the water out of it, there would only be 40% of the weight left. Wow. Um, uh -huh. So uh, it's, it's hard to think of how fluid we are. Uh, we're mostly water, yeah. and uh, even the densest parts of us are, are mostly water. Yeah. So the question is, is that water being carried around? Is it getting new material to make the new cartilage? And then when stuff gets made or re repaired, I should say, it repairs one bond at a time, so it's very easy to break in the first days. Um, mm -hmm. So that if you move the wrong way uh, and keep opening this thing up, you keep opening it up again and again and again and again, and it just never really gets started healing. I'm not a great proponent of hydrocortisone, but that's that was the idea with cortisone was uh, of the steroids that you inject them and you speed up the metabolism so that more of these bonds form in a shorter period of time, so that overnight you get enough to catch. Oh, yeah on something and then the healing can proceed from there because you're not breaking it up and going back to zero and breaking it up and going back to zero again and again and again. Yeah. Um, but the 
trouble was that the, this that thing came up in England, and there were really skilled needlemen who knew exactly where to put the cortisone. And the trouble is, the drug came over here, but the skill didn't. And <laughs> so, so many people are getting cortisone shots here, and instead they're getting it in the general area. And I went to see. I used to refer people to these so-called needlemen in in uh, England when I first went there. Mm -hmm. um, because Syriacs had just recently died and the people that he trained were still there in London. But they were very precise. They would palpate, 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 palpate until they got the right thing and then they would put the drug in the right area. And there are some cases where you just can't get something started where that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that over here that they overused the drug and underused the skill to land it exactly in the right place. Mm -hmm. But in all cases, you're looking for the system to do something to regulate itself, as we started the discussion, but to start this building process and, and to have it keep going. Yeah. So you, you, put a, you put a bone in an absolute cast for the first um, several weeks after the bone has been broken because it has to rebuild one, one molecule at a time, ah, one, nice. one bond at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, to make the bone up. After four weeks, it's a better idea to take the plaster cast off, do a little movement with your leg, put a belt and put a fiberglass cast on with some Velcro so that you can keep the leg still most of the time, but that yeah. you do some movement so that you are um, essentially you show the fascia. I think this is, sounds very anthropomorphic, but you're showing the fascia where to go with your movement. That's true of yoga. That's true of rehabilitation movement, um, because movement and loading the movement organizes the fascia. That's what tells the fascia how to organize itself. So you want, in the palm of your hand, you want the fascia to be going in all different directions, mm -hmm. um, because your hand is subject here. If you, know, if you catch a ball, it's going to go this way, this way, this way, this way. So you want the fascia going in all different directions. You don't want the fascia going in all different directions in the tendons that are going through your uh, carpal rest. tunnel, you want them very organized in one line yeah, and right. no fraying and no, <laughs> no touching, <laughs> no, right. no grabbing on anything else that's around you. And um, so if you hold your hand still for a very long time, your tendons will start grabbing onto the stuff that's around them. So the trouble with putting your hand in a cast for eight weeks, for instance, is, is you can get all these scar tissues catching up because things aren't being used. Yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. So much more, because of the fascial research, physiotherapy now is going much more toward a, okay, we hold it still for a little while, but then we right. get you to start moving. Yeah. And that's really come out of the fascial research. Interesting. Yeah, because you also refer to the fascial system as a biomechanical regulatory system. So is that, that this concept that, um, you know, all those fibro, fibroblasts that form the fascia, the way they differentiate is through this mechanical pressure input? Yes, they differentiate. The, the, the things that come under pressure tend to form into cartilage or bone. The things that come into tension tend to form into muscles and ligaments. Um, so that's very early on in the embryological stage. Um, if we're talking about repair of an injury, then um, it is this, what, what I was just saying is you have to hold it still enough to get it started and then give it movement enough to get it organized. And that's a trick, that's a neat mm -hmm. trick because uh, it's different lengths of time for different people um, with different nutritional considerations, different ages, different uh, probably genetic makeups. Um, the loose ligamented people, people who actually end up in yoga class a lot, um, the people who have lax ligaments who can bend their fingers way back and that kind of thing, um, they're going to take longer to heal because they have fewer cells crawling around their system creating new fascia. Mm -hmm. um, the guys in the weight room who really should be in the yoga class who don't have a lot of length in their muscles um, probably have more cells crawling around laying down more fascia so that they get stiff really easily and um, the uh, laxly implemented people are you, you have the advantage of staying lax and staying limber and keeping your movement easily and you have the disadvantage of healing more slowly generally speaking mm. there's, there's other factors in this of course but yeah generally speaking they'll heal more slowly they'll heal these injuries more slowly 
So it, it sounds like, um, you know, as we understand more about these mechanics of how fascia impacts basically what we might call the ongoing reconstruction of the body, that it will also have some pretty significant influence on how we view fitness and what's considered appropriate approaches to fitness. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, and that's why I say, I have been saying that we're trying to develop a yoga for the 21st century and that um, obviously all the, the uh, types of yoga are seeing, well, what fits with whom now? Um, what's going to fit with office workers? We haven't, yoga has never had to deal with a whole generation of office workers. Yoga has never had to deal with a whole bunch of people who work hooked up electronically to the internet. Um, we need it. We need yoga for the 21st century, and, and personal training, which has, of course, been around for a long time. I mean, this goes yoga and martial arts, and martial arts is what leads directly to sports. Martial arts are goes back into the mists of time with yoga, um, and of course with folk dance. Those are the three major um, sort of arms with which people were trained in movement. Mm -hmm. They were trained to hunt. The hunting skills became warlike skills. Warlike skills became martial arts. Martial arts became sports. Um, all of these things that we have in our modern world to take care of our body were were based on older forms of, of training. But we're in an absolutely new situation now. We need to develop a, a yoga that works for people in the 21st century. And, uh, you know, we look at the kids going to school now. Ten, ten years ago, it was, it was only ten years ago that we were that I was writing columns about how kids had their backpacks and they had so many books in their backpacks that their head was being shoved forward by the weights and the backpacks coming off, and that this was a national crisis. Well, it's all in an iPad now. You know, they're not carrying books to school anymore. They uh, or they won't be shortly. Uh, they're, they're getting their homework assignments on an iPad, they're doing the work on an iPad, and they're submitting it on an iPad, and they're getting their grades on it from, uh, from <laughs> the, net, you know, the internet. Yeah. This whole problem of carrying too many books has been solved. Yeah. We've also know, though, from recent, this was actually just came out a couple of weeks ago, that they did bone density studies on every bone that they could find from 10,000 years ago. Uh, in the pre-agricultural times, and all of those bones were denser than ours. Our bones are not as dense as people who lived back in that times because we don't make the demand right. that we had back in those times. So yeah. uh, I, I hear these arguments between, oh, what's better, yin yoga or shanga yoga or this yoga or that yoga. I, I hear them with a little bit of amusement because I think we're developing a whole new style of yoga and maybe none of these things are going to be appropriate for the 21st century maybe one of them is most likely is each one of them are going to be suited to different types of people and that's what we're going to find out as we as we move along oh this person needs more of an ashtanga type because of their genetics because of their makeup because of their diet uh, because of what they're trying to do this person needs another form yeah. because they have a different constitution but i think it's really fascinating how this is all working out both in the marketplace and in the, and in the research lab. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the great things that's happening also is that people are doing a lot of cross styles, you know, because in the same way as with fitness, you have cross training, you don't want to do necessarily the exact same thing every day. Uh, same thing with the yoga practice. Some days you want a really rigorous stronger practice or any kind of rigorous practice and other days a restorative practice may be more suited for whatever is happening going on with the body. Which is why a service like yours is such an interesting thing, because people can pick and choose off the internet what they wanted, whereas if they're going to their local, I live, I live way out in the country, my choices for going to a yoga teacher are, um, if, if I'm willing to drive a half an hour, I think I could get to three or four different yoga teachers. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know... <laughs> Most yeah. cities have a much bigger variety that you could choose from. Yeah. Um, that makes it more difficult in the marketplace in a way, um, but it makes it a much more interesting social experiment. <laughs> right, see right. What goes on, yeah, uh, yeah. With people. But I think the availability of all these different kinds of teachers on the internet is a really uh, it's a great development. It's, we'll be interested to see what happens. Yes, yes, it's a very very fast growing field with uh, really enriching the whole the whole field very much i feel 
Um, but I want to return just for a second to your idea of doing different things, because that, that the research is very clear on that. And the idea of doing the same practice again and again, um, well, the research is saying that varying the vectors by which you exercise is the healthiest thing for the fascia and the muscles and the nerves. This is just coming in on all different levels, which is, and so I do waggle my finger at the yoga teachers uh, when I get a chance to, to teach um, to them um, or with them, that the that doing the practice badly sometimes, that changing the way that you do things, not doing the same poses every time in the same way, is going to be much healthier for all of your body, for your nervous system, for your muscles, for your fascia. Um, that said, I've been doing rolfing for 40 years. I've been doing the same 10 sessions. It's not the same 10 sessions, obviously. I vary it from person to person, but um, there, there is a, there's a great value in having a deep practice of something as well as, as a, a wide yeah. practice. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I don't, I wouldn't, uh, based on my own experience, want to stop people from doing a Tai Chi form that they've done every day for 30 years or a yoga form that they've done every day for 30 years. There is an intense value in that, in that you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the practice. Right. What the research is saying about tissues, though, is that there should be variety in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so it's, it, I always think of it like a kid's gyroscope. Did you have gyroscopes when you were a kid? I did, you know, you pull this yeah. thing and it goes around. Yeah. Um, but there's, I want this 360 degree view of, of my own fitness, especially as I age, as I yeah. get older. Um, I want this 360 degree view, but boy, I wouldn't want to lose the depth that I've gotten from having done the same thing for a long time as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, now, last question, and it's a big question, but I hope you can address it in from some form or shape without uh, me having to keep you for another half hour. Um, Ida Rolf, you know, we talked about her and how she was very visionary, both you know, in terms of the, you know, understanding the importance of the fascia for the posture regulation of and the structural health of the body. Um, but one thing that Ida Rolf also really emphasized was the link between the fascial, the structural component and the emotional um, makeup of a person and how that is also potentially tied to the fascia. Um, could you talk about that connection a little bit? I will. I, I want to say from the beginning that to separate the fascia from the blood and the other fluids or from the nervous system is an impossible task. It's something that we do analytically. Mm -hmm. um, so I say, oh, well, we understand about the nervous system, we understand about the cardiovascular system, but we haven't understood about the fascial system. That's, that's, tr that's the truth. Um, but in your body, it, they've always been married to each other. They yeah. started out from one cell, so they were never separate. Yeah. So when we say the emotional self, I have a very strong feeling and conclusion from my studies that those emotions are held in all those tissues, that the emotions are held in the neurological tissues and in the cardiovascular tissues and in the organs and in the fascia. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to set this in motion by saying, oh, well, these things are stored in the fascia and these things right, are stored yeah. in the nervous system. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm about to, I'm about to say that exact thing, <laughs> <laughs> which is that I, I do believe that the kinds of things that I come across when I'm working in the fascial system, the kind of things that yoga people come across when they've been working for a while in the fascial system are these deeper patterns. Mm -hmm. These deeper patterns always involve an emotional component to them. They have a feeling component. Mm -hmm. So I, um, if you hold, uh, see if I can do this quite simply, your brain is always, your nervous system is always checking the outside world and seeing how the outside world is compared to your expectations. Mm -hmm. When your expectations are not met, 
not met by your boss, not met by your spouse, that's a very frequent one. Um, children, the world, the world has not treated you the way you thought. This creates a discrepancy in your brain that you tend to export to muscular tension. Interesting. Um, yeah. You want to do something about it, but you can't do something about it, so muscles get turned on and they never get turned off. Hmm. So, in a way, I have to say almost all of these things that we're talking about are neurogenic. They come from the nervous system, they come from our sense of alarm, our sense of anxiety that the world is not treating us the way that we think in our infinite wisdom that it should. Yeah. Um, and when you export this uh, tension to the muscles, that's going to change the fascial pattern. So, stuff gets stored in scars, stuff gets stored in tension, stuff gets stored around the organs. Um, but I'm talking my experience. I don't know what an emotion is, and I don't exactly know how emotions get stored. I know when I touch certain places in the body that out they come. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that they express themselves as yeah. a fluid experience, they express themselves as a neurological experience, and you see this uh, change in the whole fascial tone of the, of the body who, of somebody who has these kinds of releases. But I don't think that locating it particularly in the fascia is that useful. I think these things are body-wide, they happen in all the systems at once, they alert your whole body. Um, and it's a whole body pattern when you try to store them away and not have them. Oh, this anger, I'm not going to have this anger, I'm going to put it away somewhere. Yeah. Um, it sits there. Yeah, yeah. And the longer it sits there, the more it gets stored in the fascial system. But again, I wouldn't really separate the fascial system from the others. Right. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so last but not least, do you have a course coming up on Yoga U about the neuroanatomy of the body and you know what the implications are for yoga practice and yoga practitioners? Could you tell us just briefly what you will be covering? The study of anatomy is really the study of parts. That's the way we have gone about anatomy is dissecting out parts, naming them, and describing their function. And this really does not sit well with the yoga practitioner because you are dealing with the body as a whole. Um, so I'm urging you to come and try uh, the anatomy courses that we're doing, that I'm doing here on Yogi U Online, because they uh, come after the anatomy in terms of holes uh, instead of in terms of parts and how do holes work together. I've been um, trying to rework this in my mind ever since I became an anatomist many years ago, and this opportunity at Yogi U is uh, a way for me to put out this holistic anatomy in terms of holes in a way that we haven't really thought before. So, okay. Great, wonderful. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. It's always great and very interesting to talk with you. I wish we could keep you all day long, but I know that you have to recover from jet lag. <laughs> okay, well, I'll do that. And thanks very much. Always a pleasure to talk with you. All right, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>